a lot has been written and said about epidemiology, sometimes on the basis of very little knowledge. And I'm aiming here to correct that. It seems these days that everyone's an epidemiologist, which in practical terms means that no one's an epidemiologist, because there's so much noise, who do you trust? So I decided to try a novel idea. Go back to first principles about how I find out how to do something where I have no prior knowledge. Back in the early days of my academic career, computer science was still a fairly new subject, and I often found myself creating a course or getting into a research area where I had no knowledge to, to work on. So I would find people to talk to, I'd read the literature, work on examples, and then try to validate my learning by writing papers. So this time around I found a UK modeler to ask a few, few questions, I read the literature, I found a publicly available model that I could work on to see how it actually worked and tried writing a few papers. So I'm still not an epidemiologist, but I do have some clue and I'd like to share what I've learned. Right, so on to some basics. So maybe you've heard of the magic number R0. That is the average number of new infections you'd expect from one infection, not counting any secondary ones from the new ones that get infected. And that applies at the start when no one else is in infected, at least as far as the person who's passing the infection on is concerned. And that's called the basic reproduction number. And this is often confused with another thing called plain R, no zero subscript, which is also the average number of new infections from a particular infection, but it, at a given time as the disease is pro progressing, you expect R to reduce as you start running out of new people to infect, and that's called the effective reproduction number. Possibly also you've heard of herd immunity, and that is when the fraction of the, pop the, fraction of the population where R is equal to 1, so as the disease is spreading and R is reducing, it eventually hits 1. So new infections stabilize and eventually they'll start to reduce. And you find definitions like this at this website, and these are things I found many other places, but this is a nice one that summarizes them. So if R did not decrease, you'd get exponential growth, which would be like compound interest on steroids. Over a time short enough where R does not change noticeably, it does appear to grow exponentially. In the United States, for instance, three March, cases grew by 20 to 40 percent per day almost for the entire month. Now, growth like that is not sustainable. First of all, you run out of new cases to infect, so R starts to drop. And also, fear in the population causes defensive behavior. So, let's look at what would have happened if that exponential growth hadn't actually stopped. So back in the 20th of March, the United States had under 20,000 cases. So look at the dashed purple line. By the 28th of May, they had just under 1.8 million. So if the, the number of cases had grown at the exponential rate that we saw through much of March, then what would have happened is well, the red line represents 40% growth per day, and the blue line, 20% growth per day. So clearly 1.8 million cases is not nearly as bad as this prediction, so it didn't grow exponentially. It still has grown pretty fast. So let's see where R0 comes from. First of all, it's a property of the disease. How contagious is it? Secondly, it depends on how the population tends to mix. Is it a population where people mix a lot socially, there are other factors as well, like personal hygiene, how people cough, whether people wear masks routinely and so on. And then the other thing is how long is a particular individual contagious. So let's look at how this works out for COVID-19. Our zero estimates vary a lot because of those population variations. The common value you see quoted is 2.5, but you get higher and lower values in that. So let's see how that relates to our old friend herd immunity. So if R is 2.5, or 0 is 2.5 rather, then herd immunity happens at 60% of the population, but you get a concept called overshoot. So actually the 
infections keep spreading until something like 90% are infected. So a big misconception about herd immunity then is it represents a stopping point. If the population is already at that level before infections start to rise, it would suppress fast. So this is how our vaccines work. If you can vaccinate anywhere close to or better still more than the herd immunity level, then a disease is not going to spread very far. For rapidly rising infections, the herd immunity does not stop the infections fast enough. So the relatively high R0, the natural herd immunity, is not a great play unless you're dealing with a disease that doesn't tend to kill many people. And in this case, the COVID-19 disease does kill enough people that this is a problem. But let's move on to how we count fatality. First of all, there's mortality rate, or MR. That's the fraction of the overall population who die of a particular cause here, COVID-19. Then there's infection fatality rate. That's the fraction of those who are actually infected who die. And in case fatality rate is the fraction of known infections who die. And that is generally lower than the infection fatality rate because you don't have perfect testing. And then the final one is excess mortality rate, or EMR. And that's the fraction of the population who've died over and above the number you'd usually expect to die over that t uh, time of year. And I'll get back to that one later, but we'll focus there on MR, IFR, and CFR. And we'd expect MR to be less than IFR, which you'd expect to be less than CFR. So why would you expect that? Well, MR is calculated by dividing by a bigger number, the whole population, not just those who are infected. And the infection fatality rate is dividing by a bigger number than case fatality rate because testing misses some of the infections. And big question is whether untested cases are less likely to die. Well, if you have got reasonably good testing, probably not, because you'll be focusing on finding as many as possible of the more vulnerable cases, and the ones who don't get tested are probably the asymptomatics. On the other hand, if things run seriously out of control, a lot of people are going to be dying without being tested. So generally speaking, you'd expect that relationship at the top of the slide to hold. Next question is, who do we count as a fatality? Well, the overwhelming majority of recorded deaths have comorbidities. So they don't just die of COVID-19, but they have a heart problem, hypertension, or high blood pressure, and diabetes, or obesity, or some other underlying condition. So did the person die, for instance, of a heart attack if they were tested positive for COVID-19? And this that's why excess mortality rate is a good indicator. There have been several studies of societies where there's been a relatively high rate of infection that has shown that the number dying is a lot higher than the normal number for that time of year, sometimes two or three times as high as normal. So another important detail that I briefly mentioned before, asymptomatic, those are people who are infected but never show symptoms. And there's a lot of Variation on estimates of what fraction are asymptomatic from under 10% to over 50%. And part of that variation could be that if somebody's tested and they test positive and have no symptoms and they just don't get tested again, they may subsequently develop symptoms but not get reported. And it's also not clear for how long you're contagious and how contagious you are if you're asymptomatic. Slightly more studied cases pre-symptomatic People who are infected are not showing symptoms yet, and some studies have shown that in those cases people are contagious for at least two days before they show symptoms. And one study has shown that of the approximately 2.5 R0 value, about 0.9 of that can be put down to pre-symptomatic infection, so it is a fairly significant factor. And a bit more reading, the top one is a paper I wrote pushing the case for investigating the asymptomatic thing harder. But nonetheless, whether asymptomatic is a factor or not, pre-symptomatic is definitely a major factor in how fast the disease spreads. So, on to how these things are modelled. 
common way of doing this is to divide the population into four categories, susceptible, exposed, infected, or recovered, or SEIR model. Susceptible means you're not infected and have no immunity. Exposed means you're infected but not yet contagious. Infected means you are infected and contagious, and recovered means you are no longer contagious and immune. So the presumption here is that once you have got through the disease, you don't catch it again, and so far that seems to hold up. It does not model deaths, so the recovered category actually includes death switches. Fortunately, a relatively small fraction, even if it's a lot compared with other causes of death. And you know, once you've died, you're not going to pass it on to anyone else. So as long as people have recovered are also immune in terms of the further progression of the disease, it doesn't really make a difference, although it does make a big difference to people who don't want to die. So it's important to know that SEIR is not a new concept. It's a very well-studied theory. The oldest paper I could find on the subject was from 1976. It's been used for many diseases. It has to be adapted to a new one because each new d disease is different in terms of its mode of spreading and, and uh, each population is going to be different. But we're not talking about a novel theory here. So how do we contain the spread? Well, there's three basic strategies, non-pharmaceutical interventions or NPIs, medication or vaccines, which are technically also medication, but they're prevention. So the other category of medications are cures or reducing the worst effects, which is good, even if it's not as good as a cure. I don't want to go into that. That's a very long, complicated story. But my focus here is really more on the NPIs. Why they matter is going back to the flattening the curve thing, which is one of the most misunderstood concepts. It's not just about slowing the pace to avoid overwhelming hospitals, but it can also reduce total infection and fatalities. So I'm going to look at a simplified sim simulation using an SEIR model. It doesn't attempt to model a particular population accurately. It doesn't model deaths, but it has many variants you can play with and has the benefit that's created by a real epidemiologist. So I'm going to go to a particular example here now where we try to model natural herd immunity. So the sliders at the top left allow you to change how fast the disease progresses and the way they are set gives you an R0 of 2.5. And we're going to ask you to simulate a year and five seconds so this will run quite fast. If you look in the main box, it shows that only 0.01% of the population is infectious, and no one is exposed, recovered, and the rest are all susceptible. So let's watch how this thing progresses. And I'm running through a year pretty fast, and notice we have three different colored curves. The darker one at the bottom, a dark shade of red or pink, is the infectious cases, and the lighter shade pink above that are the exposed ones, which gradually do merge into infectious. So this model is not taking into account asymptomatic. And the gray curve is recovered, which grows steadily as you get through the number of cases. Notice also the vertical line. That marks the point where you hit the herd immunity level. And the horizontal dotted line is the herd immunity level at 60%. But notice that although the curve for exposed and infectious drops immediately at that point, the total number of cases, which you can see as the recovered curve grows, carries on going through that point. And at the end, you have nearly 90% who've been infected, which is the final recovered number. Remember that also includes the people who died. So despite herd immunity being in 60%, nearly 90% eventually end up getting infected, which is the key takeaway from this slide. So are lockdowns a good idea? Well, certainly not ideal. They can clip the peak and get to herd immunity with less overshoot, but economically they're very hard. So we need to look at cases that have contained 
the virus successfully. So what's the gold standard? So I'm going to look at four successful interventions. Taiwan, Iceland, New Zealand, and Germany, which are roughly in that order in terms of success. All of them have the same basic idea, rapid testing followed by contact tracing, and isolating everyone who tested positive. So let's have a look at the progression of active cases, which is the most important measure in terms of immediate impact on society, the number of hospital beds you need, the number of people who are stuck at home, too sick to, to go out and so on. And all of these are very similar shaped curves. They hit a peak and they go down, fairly similar to the the CIR simulation I showed you. So let's look at what, how these differ. And the big difference is on the peaks. If we look at Taiwan, for instance, its peak is at just over 300. Iceland peaks at just over 1,000. New Zealand a little bit less. And Germany at over 70,000, which seems bad, but Germany was caught more, a bit more by surprise than the other countries, but they nonetheless implemented the rapid testing, tracing, isolating thing, and they managed to turn it around, and the number of active cases hit a peak and declined. And all of this from, is from the World Amateurs site. Let's look now at the US. No peak here. The numbers are still going up. And at over a million active cases, it's a huge load on the hospital system and a drain on the productive capacity of society. Look at active cases in South Africa, we see a similar picture, the numbers are much smaller, but we haven't hit a peak. So let's look now at our same simulation site as before, but where we add in test, trace, isolate. We start with R0 is 2.5, but now we have possibilities of isolating cases, physical distancing, and finally, the big one, vaccination. So let's run this again and run it fairly quickly. It gets through two years in eight seconds. Notice the different vertical color bands and what do those each represent? Well, the first blue one represents lockdown where we've stopped the peak from accelerating as fast. And the next one is where we implement test, trace and isolate, which stops it from uh, shooting up again and then the final one is a yellow band where we introduce vaccinate and that is the one where we finally get the number of people who are immune up to above the herd immunity level the dashed line but note the time scale of this estimate is about 18 months from the start to get to having an effective vaccine. So we don't get there, the test, trace, isolate thing continues and as do social distancing measures. And so really it's only with the vaccine that we can finally end the thing, that new outbreaks are contained and we don't end up with large numbers of fatalities. So how could we do better? In cases arising, it's hard to scale up testing and contact tracing. The two options, lockdown harder, and, or be smart about testing and contact tracing. The last one is the best idea, but time is running out. So what can we do for a better testing strategy? Well, one I'm going to look at here is called pooled testing, where you combine multiple samples into a pool, and if many of the samples are negative, you can save a lot of tests. This is not a new idea, it's been used for other scenarios, but as with any old idea, you need to test it for the new disease, and there's a growing body of research showing it does actually work for COVID-19. So let's look at how that works. So let's look at a situation where we've got 100 different samples, and we want to find a relatively small number of positive cases in that 100. So the first step is we pull them in the horizontal direction, and we take each group of 10, as illustrated with the lines around them, and we test each as if, as if they were a single sample, so we mix them together. And the result we get is seven of the ten pooled samples come back as negative, the empty boxes, and the positive ones come back 
as illustrated in red boxes, and we find in 10 tests that there are somewhere buried in there three or more positive cases. We now need to isolate where they are within those pooled samples. So now we pool in the vertical direction. So instead of mixing the samples across a line, we now mix them down and do another round of testing. And now we find another three positives if we look at it in that orientation. And that's 10 more tests. So the next thing we do is we identify the intersections. If we look at the rows and columns with the positive cases, we get these nine possible candidates for where there could be uh, <clears throat> there could be positive cases, and we've done 20 tests so far. So now we can pull out those nine individuals and test each one individually, and what we find is three of them test positive. So that additional nine tests brings our total to 29, and we can now see where those original nine were in the original layout. So, so 29 tests. That's a saving of 71% compared with testing all 100 individually. Quite a substantial saving. So in summary, for this particular pooling approach, if we had 3%, 3 out of the 100 who test positive, we can save over 70% of the test cost by pooling, and that 3% is about the current rate in South Africa. But about 3 out of 100 tests are turning out positive. Not only can we save cost, but also time. And this is just one approach. I've left out a lot of detail of the individual steps, and there is an act, and it is an active area of research, and some have studied even more dilution of samples with good results. But the more you dilute the samples, the more likely you are to miss a case. On the other hand, you can do a lot more tests for the same money and in the same time. So, but, so on to contact tracing. In South Africa, it's being done essentially using interviews and paper records. It's time consuming, it's not super accurate, people don't remember everyone that they met in the last few days. And other countries are taking a more technological solution using Bluetooth, which is a short range form of communication between phones, including some quite unsophisticated phones, and geolocation, the ability to identify where you are, which would take a slightly more advanced phone, and there are privacy issues, but there's a lot of work going on in this area. And India, for instance, has released the source code of the software that they're working on. And so it's not an area where we need to start from scratch. So let's go on now to some criticisms of the South African approach. First one is the claim that the lockdown will kill more people than it saves. The other one is that the SEIR modeling is flawed because two feet people are dying. If the models were correct, a lot more should be dying. We should have stopped the lockdown after scaling up hospitals and sourcing enough ventilators. So let's look at those criticisms. First of all, this EIR model is used to predict how to drive down cases and hence de deaths. And the NPI strategies that we advocated were advocated based on those models and they have worked. The other issue is failing to understand the real logic of flattening the curve, which is leading to flawed critiques. It is not true that eventual cases and deaths will be the same irrespective of the curve as we, as we saw with previous simulations. Where the government is going wrong is too much emphasis on sourcing ventilators. Models and data should be public and there should be far more emphasis on testing and contact tracing. So why shouldn't the government be going all out to source ventilators? Well, first of all, you can't scale them up without scaling up ICU nurses. The normal ratio is one nurse to one patient, and with two shifts, you need two nurses per ventilator. With very skilled ICU nurses, you can get by with fewer. But we're talking about scaling up rapidly, which means a lot of very inexperienced nurses. A normal ICU training takes one to two years, so it's not an instant thing. And the other thing is you're much better off reducing the number who are severe enough to need an ICU. A ventilator is not magic. 
many people put on one don't survive an intubation, an extubation, putting a tube down somebody's throat or taking it out. There are also serious infection risks for both the patient and for the person doing the work. There are also recent studies that show better ways to give respiratory support than ventilation. So the gold standard for flattening the curve is contact tracing, testing, isolating positive cases, as we saw before. Taiwan, Taiwan and Iceland got it early and effectively. South Korea, and, Korea, South Korea and Germany a little late, but they also managed to contain it. And South Africa has not flattened the curve enough, and that is their concern. So where next? It's important to understand the science and to understand what works and what doesn't. South Africa is partially on the right track, but we could do better. So here are a few steps for government to consider. First of all, make as much as possible of the data modeling public, only limited by privacy concerns. Look into expanding testing urgently. Pool-based testing, for instance, is increasingly in use increasingly in use elsewhere, you get contact tracing on a sound footing. Don't be proud if somebody else has the tech, use it. And finally, a bit of advice to the public. In Boston, Massachusetts, the hospital system in a real hotspot was curtailed the spread within their own system by four measures, which they talk about as a drug cocktail. As one of them on its own isn't good enough, but all four have made a difference. The first is distancing, Second is hygiene, the third is screening, and the final one is masks. If you understand the purpose of all those things and you do all of them consistently, and you not only reduce the risk to yourself, but you reduce the risk, if you do catch it, of passing it to someone else. So knowledge is power. We can all make it through this, and I hope this has helped you to put yourself in a better position.